Okay, here we go. This seems to be a total fail. Uh, okay, hi, this is John Reed. I am streaming live, but not on every platform because I'm still uh, having some issues with Twitter. Who's trying to exact a pound of flesh for me to stream live? So anyhow, this is pretty impromptu, so I'm not sure how it's going to go as far as uh, usually I usually have some audience and guest participation, but I got out of my dental appointment early. And I just had to do this. I've been doing some shows on generative AI and creativity, and I think they've overall gone pretty well. Uh, had some really smart guests who brought some really important stuff to the table. And uh, now I need to kind of break it down in, into some kind of a writing scenario and kind of summarize for you what I've learned. But anyhow, um, sorry, I'm distracted by all the notifications I'm getting right now. So anyhow, like, I think it was really productive, but there's been an important article that's come out since that time. So I really need to get into this particular article and why it matters to the debate. And I kind of want to get back to the issue around why I was wrong around creativity and, and jobs, um, because I think that's at the heart of this new article as well. Um, the article is written by Brian Merchant. His substack is really good. I got to call it up now. Sorry, I didn't have this ready for you. It's called Blood in the Machine. Brian's a journalist. He takes no prisoners. And he writes about AI and other technologies, but mostly from the perspective, I guess I would say, of workers and worker empowerment. So he's not, you know, what you would call an enterprise beat writer per se and may not be in a loop on everything that's happening in the enterprise around AI, but I look to some of these consumer AI critics to get a deeper perspective. So I want to talk to you a little bit about his most recent piece on the rage over using AI to automate the arts. In fact, I want to go through that piece pretty carefully today. So I'm going to do that. Uh, if you're watching, will you just comment so I know that you're here uh, on LinkedIn? And uh, yeah, I'm sorry about my Twitter peeps. Eventually, I'll get back to streaming on Twitter, but there seem to be some issues. So um, what I wanted to talk about today was why I was wrong about generative AI and creativity on jobs, because this is an important story. I just wrote a monster blog post on Digitonomica about generative AI project success in the enterprise and whether it's a realistic goal. And it's kind of a mid-year assessment and uh, I watched the sunrise writing this post. That's what it takes sometimes to get it done. And I'll give you just a very quick summary. You can check it out on Digitomica. But basically, I talked about a few key themes, including you know that we really don't have a whole lot of customer use cases yet. What kinds of use cases are emerging? Uh, some of the good work the vendors are doing around what I call their responsible AI ar architectures, because I really do want to give uh, enterprise vendors credit when they get some of this stuff right. I think enterprise vendors done a good job of improving generative AI output. And so those responsible AI, ar AI architectures have been an important focus of my work. Then, I, But I also talk about how the financial markets are wising up, which gets a little bit back to this whole jobs issue and to what extent are jobs being taken by generative AI. And I generally agree with the Goldman Sachs take that AI, uh, well, it's kind of a compilation of authors within that report, but basically there's one author in particular that writes about how AI is really about tasks right now more than co complete jobs because it kind of lacks a little bit of the problem solving dimensions and other capacities that involve like a pure job. So, you know, I was kind of saying like that the job disruption is going to be more evolutionary and I kind of still believe that, but especially with certain creative professions, it's a little bit different. Um, part of it is the impact on freelancers because it's easy to, it's, you know, a freelancer isn't really necessarily always doing a complete job. They're delivering on spec. So that's a little bit more like a task than a job in some ways. Uh, but also, you know, some of these areas around, uh, let's face it, AI can be pretty good at, um, you know, acceptable, suitable content on a certain level, as well as image generation and things like that. So translation services, image, image design services, not so much art as in like great art, but jobs around that. 
But one of the other things I really underestimated was, you know, when I was saying like that the job impact wouldn't be as intense on creative professionals, part of what I was talking about there was my assumption that sort of enterprises would not take shortcuts around the technology and and kind of put out substandard stuff. But I was wrong. (laughs) Uh, I think a lot of enterprises are looking to cut corners with this technology. And I think that's a big theme in Brian Merchant's work as well, because I think he had a kind of similar view on tasks versus jobs, but I think he's been forced to rethink that a little bit. I think that's an interesting point, um, especially in the entertainment professions per se. So some of these themes are a little bit outside the enterprise context, but I will sort of tie them in a little bit. Um, The other sort of theme was around like, which are the really cool enterprise use cases and where are we getting traction? Where are we seeing the best results? And I would say in that uh, service and support assistance, that's one of the areas that's been the biggest focal point of Gen AI so far. That's another example where a lot of enterprises, I think, are cutting corners and either using uh, chatbot technology that isn't uh, as effective uh, in terms of the architecture behind it and serving up crappy answers and bullshit that's making, you know, bad headlines or, you know, just cutting corners. I've heard a lot of anecdotes back channel around like cutting out too many call centers and I've got to deal with these bots and I can't escalate to humans, which is really just more poor design and cost cutting than a reflection on on the technology necessarily. So anyway, that's another area where I think I've been a little bit wrong and have to take my lumps you know, for saying, well, you know, it's not mature enough to handle all these things. Well, if a company doesn't give a crap and wants to go ahead, then that kind of undermines my, my approach a little bit. <laughs> so, uh, so anyhow, uh, along those lines, uh, creativity is one of the themes I looked at in terms of the use cases that are emerging in the enterprise context. In the consumer context, you know, I, I talk about how there isn't an enterprise killer app yet for Gen AI, but in the consumer side, there are there is. And the consumer side, you know, uh, the killer apps are mostly uh, not so much what you would call like uh, inspiring killer apps. It's more, although I think some of the killer apps, I talked a little bit around the relationship based ones. I think there's a, there's a few sites that are doing really quite well with, with bots around relationships and you have a bot companion. Some of them are adult pornographic. Let's, let's be clear. Um, but, but some of them are not, and they're, they're doing pretty well. And, and I think, I don't know if that's a killer app, but it is a successful business model. And then of course I talk about things like disinformation at scale and deep fakes, uh, being killer apps in the, in the context of the consumer space. And I think that's where some of Brian Merchant's frustration around gen- generative AI comes from is he's looking a lot at the cult- culture and consumer impact where I think you've seen a lot of, uh, problematic designs brent lots of poor designs for this out there yeah for sure brent and one of the things i got into in the article was a little bit about i i did do a, a case study earlier about a a, a a company that did design a good service bot experience and i actually did an interview with another vendor i'm going to be writing about that also did so they are out there uh if you want to check my post it'll it'll keep you um uh, reading a little bit uh, this weekend. If you like, you know, relaxed uh, hobby reading on generative AI over the weekend, I'll, I'll pop the post in there. But it's, uh, uh, you could do a search on Digitomica for John Reed and generative AI and projects and you probably find it that way too, but in, posted the link as well. So in that context, I kind of said, okay, I'm done with the creativity videos right now. I'm going to get my dental work done. But then this Bryant Merchant article came out and I really wanted to uh, talk about it. Also, uh, I did invite Liz Miller to pop on if she's around. I'm not sure if she is because she uh, was taking some victory laps on LinkedIn this week. We're pretty funny around um, Google Google's sort of semi-surprise decision to not um, banish third-party cookies after all. And Liz had some points around, like, told you so. So I thought it'd be fun to have her on to take a victory lap. So we'll see if she is able to pop on or not. Um, by the way, Brent, are you having the same experience with Twitter on the live stream? Cause I, I had a lot of Twitter people watching my shows and, um, anyway, I'm fixing it now, I think, but it's Elon Musk is giving me a hard time. All right. So Brian Merchant. So I told you about his sub stack, uh, blood and blood in the machine and, the uh, the posts that he just put out. 
So let me uh, let me grab that post for you. The great and justified rage over using AI to automate the arts. So the post is basically a reflection upon a couple of things, a couple of pieces that uh, Brian Merchant wrote. Uh, long stories in Wired. Uh, one is about a guy who built a search engine for uncovering privacy violations on the web, which is pretty cool. Uh, and the other is the about the impact AI is having on the video games industry. Namely, certain studios like Activision, which makes Call of Duty game Call of Duty games are embracing it and replacing human work with the AI generated variety. Uh, so, oh, I heard from Liz Miller on the back channel. So let me get with Liz. Uh, just one sec. Sorry about the real time disruption, but we are live. Uh, Brent, what did you have to say here? OpenAI search GPT gave Google the courage to backtrack. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they found, they found their courage. Isn't that funny how that works? Uh, let's see. What, let's see what Liz has to say. She's going to come on. Okay. Uh, cool. I'll send, send you back in link. All right. Looks like Liz Miller might be able to pop on and take her victory lap. Uh, so. Hold tight, and we will get um, we'll get we will get Liz involved here. Maybe a few minutes. I think she's still uh, getting herself situated. So in the meantime, I'm going to proceed with this deconstruction of of Brian's, and then uh, and then I'll take a break from that for for Liz in a sec. But um. So, okay, so, so Brian wrote these two posts, and, and, and this impact of AI on the gaming industry is an interesting one. And what he said was uh, that the piece on AI and gaming is blown up that speaks to where our anxieties in tech lie at the moment. There was a time um, 10 years ago where this wasn't as much of an issue, but it's clear that that people are fretting over AI, especially its threat to jobs, identity, and security. And in the wake of his video games piece, he says he's heard from so many uh, artists, translators, artists, voice actors, animators, illustrators reaching out. Their bosses want to use AI too, and it's happening to them. There, it struck a nerve, right? And so he sat down to kind of figure out why that's happening right now. And why it feels more like an existential threat than it has in the past. So he says, as a studio in gaming, AI and gaming piece revealed, studios and bosses very much are using AI to cut corners, shrink departments, and replace workers with AI services. By hiring workers familiar with AI programs to churn out more stuff faster. It's very much an open question whether or not these changes will be permanent or permanently used as leverage against workers, or whether they'll pass in the wind after the AI systems fail to improve to a point that studios find their output satisfactory, and they may turn out to be more trouble and expense than they're worth. I think that's really interesting because what it, what it tells you is that that right now, like we're at this crux where we don't really know exactly how the creativity piece is going to pan out. Um, and the reason for that, Liz is just getting set up backstage. So she's about to join. So I'll just f finish my thought here in a sec. The, the reason f that we're facing this sort of crossroads is because there's a lot of factors we don't totally know yet. We don't know, for example, how much mediocre stuff people are going to find acceptable and in what context can you get away with mediocre stuff like like for example Diginomica uses stock photo images on our posts they're not exactly beautiful images right so but but when it comes to art and entertainment that's really interesting concept right how much mediocrity are we gonna are we gonna be able to handle in our lives um i think that's one of the questions and then to what extent is this really going to save time and money uh you know to what extent are you going to be able to really get rid of your freelance professionals? Anyway, Brian's article is all about that. And I wanted to hit on it because it's directly relevant to the shows I've been doing. And Liz is about to come on. 
Okay, yeah, Elon's going to make me pay a premium to live stream to X. Yep, I'm working on it. I'm going to have to pay him as like ransom, I think. L.A. Liz, says Brent. And with that... I'll take it. L.A. Take Liz. It. I'll L.A. Take Liz, it. I got my... what up? Yeah. What up, brother? What up? What's going on in L.A.? Uh, well, I'm not in L.A. today. I'm actually okay. in Seattle today. Constellation had our annual summer solstice all-hands retreat where nice. some city is foolish enough to allow all of us to gather in one place i mean who does that I who didn't send a like, warning i saw these group hug type pictures come out you guys are like feeling like really tight as a unit right now that's very chummy we you know what we have we're like we're like you know when you get together at thanksgiving with your dysfunctional family and you just take that selfie because you know yeah. everyone needs it for christmas that's us we're like we're like this we are this really funny wonderfully dysfunctional yet totally cohesive family like i look at my fellow yeah. analysts at constellation like listen john you know this about me like if someone were to come out and try to like smack talk hold reeler I'm like doug henshin it's going down like i'm gonna fight you oh yeah There's absolutely probably gonna be some throat punching no doubt like, you don't you don't go after my brothers like you don't do that but you, no when doubt. we're together holger and i like bicker we look and we bicker like the jacket brent leary Brent, Brent wants the oh jacket. <laughs> we, I Wardrobe. Did new, I did get a new fleece jacket. Oh, you got so the I now fleece. Have two. Oh, yeah. I go with the fleece with the logo on the back. But then I also do like purple clothing. So I keep telling Ray that I keep oh, it on nice. brand. Like I'll wear a purple blazer or like I get like purple sassy tennis shoes. So like I, you know, I'm, I'm there to rep Constellation. I just can't do that. Yeah, yeah. You don't like that. You don't like that. Oh, I just got back from the back nine kind of vibe. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. It's totally me. Yeah. yeah I always, I, just, er, I think Ray saves a lot on dry cleaning with that jacket. He so super saves a lot on one dry of, cleaning. One of his secrets for like, it's, cu- you know, financial success. Is it's totally, it's very, it's very reminiscent yep. of like when I realized like there was a point in like the 10th grade when all the other girls were complaining about that we had to wear a uniform. And I hit a point where I was like, no, it's pretty great. I just roll out of bed, gray skirt, white shirt, blue sweater. Like it was, you didn't think about it. You didn't, there was no planning just out the door. And that has kind of been the hallmark of my life, John. Indeed. Well, speaking briefly of Constellation, Constellation's been putting me through the ringer lately. I, Mm -hmm. I, I did a, I did a whole, Data to Decisions uh, use case review, which is super interesting for the yep. uh, Supernova Awards. So that's always fascinating, actually. So Supernova Awards, yep. that's right. Judging, yep. first round of judging is just yeah, over. Yeah, yeah. And yep. now we're going to turn it over to the public. I'm super stoked about it, actually. Like, I look at my categories, and I know that Paul Greenberg very well might disagree with me because I will tell you, for anyone submitting, for anyone brave enough to submit, in our next gen customer experience category, you're going up against Paul, right? And Paul oh, yeah. wants detail. He wants oh, he's metrics. Not, he's not he messing wants about. a true story. He wants yeah, to see yeah. how your costs and all of CX. And then like these poor people are like, I did one thing over here in sales with my CRM. And he's like, no, like he just like they had jettisoned immediately. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, I'm grouchy like that too. Like it, I thought it was really interesting in our category how, and this is my opinion as a judge, so yeah. it, it might be different for others, but I didn't think the Gen AI ones were, were all that good. And, um, and, and there was a real I'm struggle. Okay. To, yeah. There was a real struggle to quantify exactly. the val- the value of it. Um, whereas some of the, yeah. whereas some of the other analytics stories and the analytics and automation and insight stories were really good because they tied directly to, numbers roi things like that and even like oh. other ai type stories like predictive maintenance and that's not a surprise right i mean that's what happens when you have more immature more immature technologies but it's just it's really interesting to get the use case perspective on that right and really look at totally. this is this is what's happening right now and it wasn't like the gen ai stories weren't interesting because some of them were a lot in no. the anal- in the analytics side it had to do with like the way in which some of these tools can bring and i think it's true in 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 your cx side as well it's like bringing this to more users in a more accessible way like yeah that yeah. that's definitely cool it was just that it's a little hard to quantify exactly what that means in the short term so totally uh, totally you know i think that what i loved about 
so I have two categories. I've got um, marketing transformation and I've got a next generation customer experience. And looking at all of those, any of the ones that had or involved Gen AI as the kind of crux of their transformative moment, the ones I thought were the best were the ones that actually were like, we start, we thought we were going to start someplace small. Like, mm-hmm. um, you know, there was one submission since it's going into public voting. I don't want to, I don't want to ruin it for everyone, but you'll, you'll see it when the public vote comes out on Monday, actually. Um, there was one example in the marketing category where this rather large company has completely transformed their marketing operations when it comes to their creative output because they've applied Gen AI to not do the big ideas, right? Like that's still where the creatives are. Like I was listening to you before, before yeah, I jumped yeah. on, right? That's where, that's where the creatives are still hyper, super creative, right? What they got rid of was the, let me do it in 19 shades of our brand color, right? So they, and they brought it all in one place. So now it's not just marketing that gets all of the love of all of this amazing creative work that these folks are doing, but you can be in service. You can be in sales. You could be anywhere in the org, including field, different geos. Right. And you can pull an asset, personalize that asset for your geographic location, right? And then deploy it where it used to take what, like a month? Because you had to put in the request. You had to make sure they got the right image. It went back and forth with the agency. So there, all of a sudden, you are weeks and a couple hundred dollars later because you wanted a different picture. You hit on something that was like the crux of the last show I did with Barb Mosher Zink on this, where she wrote about generative AI marketing. And, and, and what I wanted to get in with her was exactly this point, which is like, it's not that there's no use cases around quote unquote creativity, but it just feels like the really exciting stuff is freeing up people's time, right? By doing all the mechanistic right. crap that that buries marketers and campaign management totally. and, you know, translating shit to different regions and all this yeah. stuff, right? And 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 to some extent personalizing content distribution things like and yeah. I just frustrates me a little bit because why do people always have to like I feels like they have to get in a room by themselves with warm butter and say I Jen AI wrote this blog post for me. I'm like, for fuck's no, sake, write no. your own blog post and let you Jen can't. AI translate it into 20 languages for you and all that other stuff, you know? Like there's, anyway. there is a massive use case for it. But it's funny because I think people, like we want to have this muscle memory of like the warm luxury of someone else doing something for us, I guess. Like, I don't know. We like all revert to childhood and we want mom to come help us. And I think that's kind of like the weird knee-jerk reaction we all have right. for Gen AI. But right. the, I think the most incredible use cases that I've seen with Gen AI specifically, and I tend to split it into like what I've seen with text-based stuff and then what I've seen with like image and asset-based stuff. The, the text-based stuff is about the churn, right? Yeah. It's about the, I wrote something that I want to get on paper and I want to expand on it, right? Or I have an idea... I don't know, like, I, I get writer's block all the time. I'm not like you. Like, I, I can't do the, like, let me write brilliance all the time. I'm like, uh, I have a thumb. Like I, like, I just, I get stuck. And so sometimes I'll go in and I'll, I'll, use, I'll use a Gen AI tool and be like, okay, I kind of want to write about this. It will give me a paragraph. And the minute I see it, I'm like, okay, well, that sucks. Let me write it my way. Like, r- let me write it away. So right. I have found a way to use it for me, but I don't use it to write my stuff, right? On the image and the asset side, some of the most incredible use cases I have seen have been truly talented, amazing graphic artists, creators, um, both visual arts, like you name it in that space of creativity. Skip the part where you have to have pain after a sketch. Like they'll sketch something out and kind of have an idea in their head of what they want to do. And instead of all the pain of the 90 million steps to iterate from that sketch, they apply a Gen AI on that and they get like, here are your first six options. How do you want to refine from here? Does that take away from the creative for having the brilliant idea to begin with? No. Does that take away from the fact that right. they were able to sketch something that I could never do? No. So, it, just right. got, it skipped the, it skipped the, like, the icky, right. messy middle, right? So, so. I'm in in an enterprise context, a lot of this makes sense to me. And there's this thing around like, if you're gonna empower an individual to like use these tools in a way that helps yeah. them to helps them to create better and more cool stuff, then you're gonna hear no arguments from me. 
But I just I want to read you since we're talking about this. I want to get to Google and yeah. cookies in a oh, second. Yeah. But I want to read you this thing from Brian Merchant's piece because I think Brian's Brian's hitting something that's definitely much more like of a broader cultural issue than an enterprise issue. But nice. I th- I think what he wrote here is and this this came back to this thing where he he broke a story uh, in Wired around uh, Activision and some other companies basically like been laying off a lot of creators under the under the table under the yeah t- and mm-hmm. basically trying to use automation and he says brian says the pitch of automation has historically been that it will do the dangerous dirty and dull jobs so that we humans can focus on the stuff that allows for humans flourishing so why are we here watching concept artists lose their jobs to software trained on previous artists work auto generating output at the press of a button why are we automating the job of translators who have a unique knowledge of their language and culture and who can artfully translate works in a new medium. Why do we want to live in a world where instead of the actual voice actor, we have AI voice actors synthesized into a mush from all those that came before? Why do we want machines to do this stuff, the good stuff, the stuff that gives human life human value? The answer is we don't. Almost no one does, does except for dead-eyed, dead-eyed corporate executives, opportunistic founders, and tech chain boosters, and those who have an antipathy for the creative arts for whatever reason. Anyway, I think it's really interesting because some of this is some of what he's howling about. Well, first of all, I'm very sympathetic to his howl because there's a lot of people, too. people's livelihoods getting affected by this in various ways. But part of the howl, I think, is the inevitability of like how tech disrupts. And I, and I get that. And I don't think there's a whole lot. But I just think it's interesting because I just think this conversation around creativity would go a lot better if the conversation were being led by the people working with these tools. And it feels a lot of times the reason why there's so much disconnect is it feels like the conversation is being brought out by OpenAI and Google and how far they can push the envelope with these tools, whether or not the training sets that were used were ever compensated for from those that were trained. So I think it's a really interesting thing. And that was one of the things I wanted to get into in this broader series that I did was sort of this contrast between like, yes, it's incredibly useful in a jobs context, but there's also this bigger cultural yeah. impact. And I don't know where it's all going to lead. And actually, that was what was great about Brian's piece is though, even though he went on that rant, he's basically saying, I don't know where this is going either. I don't know. Like, and, and I think one of the key points there is that we all need to have a voice in this and help shape where it goes instead of just saying, well, let's passively accept this state of right. affairs. Let me you wait know? and see. So you know, that's, and, and I that's think what I want to do. If you broaden the aperture from what Brian's talking about of kind of like the creative arts, I mean, look at what happened when like the web first came out. Like we were like, oh, we're never going to have to talk to another human being again because we're just going to use the web. I'm never going to have to ask a human a question because I have search. Right? Like we, we go through yeah, these phases yeah. where we seem to think everything is going to like, I mean, listen, instant coffee didn't kill coffee. Still got it. Right. Like it no just, it's just the reality of like what happened. Right. And I think yeah. that, you know, people are like, oh, paper's going to die. No one's going to print something on paper. Like. Well, my hope, okay. I, the coffee analogy is a really good one. And my hope is that both in enterprise and non-enterprise context, people are still going to want the the fine coffee equivalent of that, whether it's art or music or, in, in my case, Diginomica. Because if people don't totally. give a shit about that, then there won't be a Diginomica five or 10 years from now. And, and um, people, so. want, like, the people want to have that variety. Like, like they get tired. And, but you know, here's the interesting thing. And it's, it's something that I've noticed because of the current political cycle and the election year that we're on. And this is not a political statement. What I've noticed is people saying things, like just kind of casually saying things like, that better not have been written by open AI. I want to actually hear what candidate A has to say. Or I, th- that sounded like AI. I want to hear candidate B say it out loud. Like there is this sense today that people are very carefully parsing authenticity. They're very carefully parsing yeah. kind of what they see, what they believe. Not everyone. There's still a lot of people that will fall for everything. We all know that. But I think that this idea of voices and voices that people want to be heard is definitely something that we're going to see a, a greater drumbeat come out around. And I mean, hey, that's it's, it's absolutely true. Diginomica, right? Like I could go to a news aggregator that probably could right. just spit out 19 headlines or I could come to you and actually hear someone's opinion that goes and the analysis yeah. of that that goes along with the headline. And I, I think that's the difference is people are starting to nuance what they want to ingest and how they want to interpret it 
they want AI, they're going to go find AI. They know 90 sources that are going to use it, right? When they want a voice, they're going to go there. It's just like with the phone. Um, yeah, and, yeah. You know, so it's I think fun, it's going to be very, it's, it's going to be very interesting to see where it all lands. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. I, I'm I'm hoping there's people that that give a shit about this stuff and want to. You know, I mean, what I keep trying to say is like, if if you don't like, okay, so if you don't give a shit on the consumer side about having accurate information or not, there's a decent chance you're already already dead because of COVID and stuff like that. Um, Probably. <laughs> but um, but on the, inter- on the enterprise side, if you don't give a crap. The result is going to be bad projects and bad bad outcomes for your customers. Oh, so, yeah. so that's that's kind of the whole thing that I'm hoping will keep the kind of stuff that I do. And to some extent, what you do alive is that sense oh, of totally. like that we need that we need better information so we can have better projects and serve our customers oh, yeah. better. So oh, that's without, that's my hope because I don't think the kind of information you describe that convenient like whatever machine generated crap that's not going to bring your project over the finish line. No. It's just not. Now Brent made Brent's made a really interesting point here. Sometimes we need Gen AI created filters to help shield us from all the great Gen AI created content. And that was the other thing I've been asking marketers is, okay, you feel really great about generating 50, 50 posts with um, you know, Chat GPT this weekend. Well, everyone else did the same thing. Like at what point is there diminishing returns? And guess what so, trained your posts? Right. It's it's like it's like that weird thing. Yeah. And I, I always get who's so going to read all that like, crap is like, what I'm wondering. Like, right. I get really confused during briefings when people like with this like huge amount of pride are like, all of our emails were written by Gen AI. Yeah, and we plugged it into OpenAI. I'm like, yes, you and 70 other brands that do the exact same thing that you do, where right. all of the emails were trained on the same emails. Oh, right. So awesome. Like I just I, I you know. We we are always, I think in marketing, we're constantly battling the sea of sameness. And we've always been battling the sea of sameness. It just comes yeah. in faster, different, more bland versions. And this is the latest one. And I think where I'm seeing the the like the the glory of the Gen X marketer right now is that we're now the CMOs, right? Indeed. We're now going into that spot and we're like, no, I'm gonna tell you exactly where I want to see that Gen AI work in. Like I, yes, I want to see you churn 90 different emails about thank you so much for resetting your password. Now let's talk about what's happening with next with your account. Like churn those all day, but don't you dare. Don't you right. dare. Like, you know, like, so I, I think that we've seen so many waves of where all of this digital transformation around content has taken us over the past 30 years. Um, but I think it's kind of our moment to shine. At least I'm hoping it is. Because we got all these kids that are like, well, I have to have Gen AI write my resume, do all of my email posts. Meanwhile, they're all spending their, like, with all that time they save, they're on TikTok watching original content that was not created by Gen AI. Like, it's, it splits my brain in half. Like, I don't understand right. how that all comes together. But I do think it is that time where, you know, I love Brent's comment because I think that the filter that we're going to have to figure out is someone kind of just standing up in the middle of the sea of sameness being like, this is bullshit. And then maybe we start to chip away from it because there is an absolute valuable, critical, money-saving, money-making place for Gen AI in enterprise. Full stop, big old period. Sure. It might not be where we're applying it right now when we're still in the sandbox experimentation phase. But the warning label on all of this is that experimentation phase is going to be done in like six months. We don't have two years to luxuriate right. over what to do with social media, right? Like it's going to be done by this time next year. We'll have figured it out. The, the winners will have risen to the top. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's, it's super fun. And if you haven't gone and played with any of these, like you were saying before, like, you know, it's, you're all on stock imagery. I have, I have artic- I've gone the complete opposite way, John. I go on to things like Firefly, and I, for all of my presentations, I have now gone, and Brent, this is just for you. This is just for you, Brent Larry. I pick a different varmint to put in my presentations. And I have Firefly put them in weird situations. Like the time I had a hamster running up a growth and margin chart on a spreadsheet, jumping over piles of money. Yeah. And I mean, look, I mean, the... The way the web works, we have to have images on our, on our totally. uh, articles. If totally. if we use Gen AI for that, and we have we don't we have took a position we're not using Gen AI in any of our writing, and that's like been established. Love but it. we but we will use it for images if we want to. But I 
I don't think it's going to really honestly be much better than the stock photos. I mean, what it no, will be, I don't. What it will be, what it will be though, at some points is more unique, right? So like, right. if I really want, like you said, if I want like, if I want like five gerbils, like chasing a executive down the street, yes. I can get that. Right. Whereas if I go on to like, you know, Adobe or whatever, I'm probably not going to find five gerbils chasing an executive. I'm going to have to settle yeah. for like, can join me for in like, this varmint parade. Yeah, a rabbit. We or can something. just do this to Brent. Like we can do this, Chuck. Does be Brent have some hut. kind of like? Does Brent have? He's some got a varmint kind of a... issue. He has a varmint issue, and does it's he? fine. It's fine. It's fine. Brent, but I'm just wow. Saying, I didn't know we about call that. It, wow. We call it the Bro Hammer Varmint Collection, and uh. we're off to the races with this. I mean, there's nothing that can stop us at this point. <laughs> wow, Brent. I had no idea, man. We're gonna have it's to get a Friday into, on. We're gonna have to get into that. Person. All right, you ready? You ready for your you ready for your uh, vic- victory ready. lap? Stretched, okay, stretched. I'm ready to roll. Okay, so uh, Google makes the semi surprising decision to not ban third party cookies. Not surprising to Liz Miller though. So you took some victory laps on LinkedIn, which I thought was appropriate. But but what was going on there? What tell us about that? So you know, about four and a half years ago, I want to say it was probably about that time. It was really one of the first indications where, you know, Google comes out with this blog post. And it was a very strongly worded blog post for Google saying, we are committing to privacy. We are not going to be left behind in this privacy move forward. And we are going to commit to eliminating and deprecating the third-party cookie across Google products, especially across Chrome. We are going to create a different, better, more secure and more privacy aware, more, you know, more consumer in control option for everyone. And within months, all of a sudden, that confidence and that tone started to crumble. And it was pretty easy to see that when the first time they said, well, you know, we were aiming for 2022, (laughs) maybe 2023, we're hoping, you know, you you could kind of see that Google had realized something really important that getting rid of the third-party cookie involved more than just an agreement between Google and the consumer. That it involved so did you always kind of think did you, did you always think it was kind of bullshit or did you, did you think, oh, it's just going to take a long time or did you think, oh, I, it's just... No, I, I, I did not see a viable way for this to move forward for Google's business. I just, I just okay. didn't. And, um, and, why, and why is that? Because the vast majority of Google's business is based on not only advertising and advertisers, But those organizations that drop third-party cookies to be able to help their advertisers do more business on Google. Mm -hmm. So this wasn't about Google's direct relationship with the advertiser. It was about the ecosystem that Google had built around advertising that allowed advertisers to use these third parties, drop in these third-party cookies to continue to advance their own quest to try to be better at understanding and knowing and reaching their customer. Now, the irony here is the third-party cookie did very little to actually do that. It made advertising more precise. It made our targeting better. It made our optimization strategies better, our spend better. So operationally, it had a big impact in the advertising world. But did it really help us know our customer any better? No, not really. That's why you saw that pivot, right? The cookie's going to crumble. Hey, everyone, you need to go collect your first-party data, right? It was almost like, immediate the immediate boomerang so so i actually the one thing i liked about all this disruption was i liked companies having to think a lot harder about first party data Amen. because i felt like i felt like and it seems like in the in the era of a- ai quote unquote this this whole element of trust is actually becoming more important so are we at risk of kind of losing a little bit of momentum around that or um, are people Mm, losing momentum, no. I don't think we're going to lose momentum. I, I, well, because I think that we had already started losing okay. momentum on that because we had matured a lot of our first party data stores. And I think we have really, as marketers and as brands... And, GD, and, and GDPR help with that too, right? GDPR, a, well, CCPRA, yeah, yeah, yeah. all of that. I think all of the regulatory shifts have really helped that. Yeah, the whole, whole cohort. Like, we're going to anonymize this data so you have a cohort. You got, no one wanted that. Everyone's like, we're good. Thanks. You know, so yeah, much. Yeah, no yeah. one wanted to buy into that. And I, I think that now, I mean, two days ago, you have the FTC releasing guidelines and releasing a very strongly worded piece around anonymized data that hashtagging and you just saying something is anonymous does not make data anonymous if it can be tied back to the consumer. 
it is still like if it can be tied back to an individual in any way, shape, or form, that is not a de- anonymous data. We now have an environment that recognizes where all the gray areas and where all the loopholes and where we've been hiding. I mean, where, you know, mediocre to bad actors have been hiding. But I think that with the, 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 this whole panic around the cookie crumbling gave marketing and gave IT an opportunity to sit down with one another and say, okay. I'm going to lose all of this operational stuff. My ad agency is in a panic. I'm freaking out because I think we're totally reliant on cookies. And I'm a manufacturer of a CPG. I don't have a direct relationship with my customer. The store that they buy my product does. What do I do? Mm -hmm. And that's where the innovation started, right? Like, okay, how do we collect data, you know, on our websites? How do we ask our customers for their preferences? How do we start to ask and collect? How do we enhance Mm -hmm. profiles? Do we create loyalty clubs? Do we... They started to think about this stuff. Just as we started to get that momentum going, someone decided to come out with that ridiculous phrase, zero-party data, where I understand that some people understand zero-party data to be foundational. Ergo, like, it's zero day, zero ground. This is the backbone of everything because zero-party data is that data that the consumer voluntarily gives you. But you know what the rest of the market and the rest of industry heard? Zero-party, it doesn't belong to anyone. It's zero party data. It's up for grabs. I can take it and I can do whatever I want with it. Hmm. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Like, no, that's not, that's not what was meant to happen. So we already started to see some bad behaviors coming out. We already started to see like, you know, the reality was we started to see people make a distinction between privacy and safety, which are two completely different things, right? Digital privacy and digital safety, completely different maybe related, sometimes within the same strategy, but different. So when we started to think about third-party cookies and wanting to protect privacy, Google realized they couldn't do that. The best they could do was get security, right? They could ensure that people were not going to do nefarious things, that they were going to respect the identity, they were going to respect the consent, they were going to respect the intention of the consumer. I think that's where Google's going to focus, and rightly so. I hope that this is the moment where marketers stand up and say, we're going to do the same thing, right? We are going to respect the difference. We are going to strive for privacy, which inherently means actually aggregating less data and trying to do more based on what the customer is inviting us to do, asking us to do, as opposed to all the other machinations around data. And really focusing on the safety of what we are providing our customers and our users, right? That we are not doing inappropriate. We're not doing all the shady things. We're not training things and pretending that the data that went on our phones wasn't there. There's so many cases right now. The Patagonia case, mind blowing. I don't know if you've seen that. It's like the Patagonia lawsuit is insane Mm. because everyone should be terrified right now. Anyone who has taken data on a vendor, like any vendor, who's taken data that's gone across their cloud and across their system and called it their data and use that to train their AI, go look up that Patagonia case. See how far you're going to get with that. Assume that your lawsuit is coming next, right? Mm. So we're entering this really interesting time when it comes to where regulators, where vendors, where organizations, and where the public are going to start making maybe some different conversations around what's happening with all this data. And could we revert to bad behavior? 100%. Do I envision the entire DMP and programmatic marketplace charging back into life after all this time? Probably not. There's, there's still going to be a space for it, but so you know, not Brent, as big. So Brent makes a really interesting point. Uh, privacy still ranks way lower on the important spectrum than convenience does to consumers. And Brent, okay. I, think that's, I think that's a really important point. And I think a lot of that obviously is also like culturally specific. And I just focusing on the US audience, I find a shocking amount of indifference overall where people have really opted for convenience over over privacy. And and I would include myself firmly in that camp. Like whether it's um the GPS type stuff of my phone knows more about me than my mother does, or the fact that I have these Amazon devices all over my house that list not right. kinds of stuff all the time. And I, you know, and so I've made those I think what's interesting, though, Brent, is I've made some really conscious choices around that for myself. And I think 
where I think brands get into trouble, and let's see what Liz thinks, is is where a lot of times there's a lack of transparency. So even if I know that you're doing stuff, like like take take Facebook, for example, how they got into trouble when uh, some guy's online and he sees his wife featured in like a hot singles in your area thing. And that's within the scope of the terms yeah. of service to use your picture like that. But you didn't realize that because you didn't re- read the 20 page terms of service and understand the fine print of yeah. what that meant. So I still think brands, even though we don't care that much about privacy, I still think brands are going to get punished and embarrassed by abuse. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So I, I'll, I was today years old when I learned that X auto sets something, uh, their inferred identity setting. Uh, they auto set it when they introduced it to on. You got to go into your settings and turn it off. And inferred identity for X, formerly known as Twitter, however we're still calling that, um, is that inferred identity is based on not only the signals and cues that X can scrape from a device that has logged into X, but it can also pull that type of data, pull all of that inferred identity data from devices or phone numbers or email addresses that you haven't used to log on, but that may appear to be connected to you. I'm sorry, what? Like, like, what, like, like what are you doing? Like, oh, but we do it to serve you more personalized advertising. Right. Trust me when I tell you that nothing on X is personalized to any of my preferences. <laughs> like yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. it is a wild west. Dis- over despite the, the fact that it's taking liberties on, you know, non Holy mother money. up. Right. And so you've got to go in. And I think that when people are confronted with moments like that, because let me tell you that the the Xiverse, the Twitterverse is a buzz with this today because people have started to figure out that also their training of AI, their humorous AI assisted grok, your data auto set to yes, go ahead and train everything from Twitter on that. So it's things like that that are starting to come into the public consciousness where they're like, whoa, maybe not. Like maybe, maybe I don't. The irony of all that is Grok's a piece of shit during the crowd strike, <laughs> during the crowd strike thing, Grok published this thing around like, oh, all these engineers are so excited about working for crowd strike that all the tweets were satirical. Um, it's just it's so it's so bad it's so bad right hey but hey I, hey, think, hey clive just a heads up we're not we're not going to do manufacturing today so just fyi you can keep commenting on it but uh my special guest liz is doing a victory lap we're we're, t- we're talking privacy and cookies in fact liz it's time well, for I, your i think it's time for your applause <laughs> you, you call of you. course of course i'm giving you credit for having called it all these years ago so so yeah. thank uh, you so what did you tell what did you tell your clients and brands like after the initial prove this to us what did you tell them after yeah. the initial ruling what was your advice then did you say just don't take it too seriously but start looking at first party data just because it's a good idea anyway yeah, or I, no you know my my initial statement was to pretty much anyone i worked with was you should already be worried and focused on first party data and building those relationships right. and building those data stores and profiles for your customer with rich permission based handed over freely data because you're going to always be able to do more with that than you'll ever be able to do with a third party cookie. Right. It's one thing to be able to target someone. That's nice. It's another thing to be able to say, "Hey John, I get that you really like dry erase pens. Let's talk." Right? right. Two completely different conversations than to just send you a whole lot of advertising about pens as opposed to Me sending you something that's like, hey, John, have you ever thought about using a purple dry erase pen on that sassy dry erase board of yours, right? Like it's, we have gotten to that point of sophistication. So the, the conversation has always been about, you need to be having conversations with your CIO, your CDO, whoever is in the ecosystem of people who are charged with enhancing, creating, securing your data infrastructure to figure out what you can start to build to be that customer data infrastructure, whether it's on a CDP, whether it's in your data garden, reservoir, who's it, whatever, fine. Let's start having those conversations. I think the brands who leaned into that, even the CPG, even the manufacturing brands that leaned into that, they look at this news of like, never mind, we've canceled the cookie popcorn as saying, oh, cool. 
So now we can go back to saving a little money and maybe being more precise on our advertising, but we're going to keep focus over here. And that's probably all of my emails, all of my texts of clients after the announcement came out was don't lose focus. The focus isn't on the ad and the focus should have never been on the cookie. The focus still has to be on your customer. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of GDP, GDPR, where the best brands were yeah. already mostly compliant in the first place. So exactly, maybe a little fine tuning, but more of a gut, ch- gut check on your strategy than anything. So, 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 why would Google do this in the first place? Like, what did they did Test they of think, intentions? Did they think at the time that privacy would also give them? I mean, obviously, we'll give them a little bit of good intentions, but was yeah. also was there also some competitive advantage there? Because one of the things that came out that Brent theorized is that because he said right before you joined that that open AI, open AI announcing their own ser- search engine is an interesting coincidence in terms of the the timing of this. It kind of yeah. it sort of makes me wonder like did Google like have a better competitive environment back then where they could dictate more the terms of things and now they don't or what do you what do you think well, accounts for that? I, I, the open AI thing I think is super interesting. I don't think it's going to be an immediate threat to Google. No, um, you know, mainly because it's search when it comes to how AI is and where the AI movement is going to be. Sure, open AI and Google are going to battle that out, and my model's better, and blah 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 blah. Fine. Um, it, but when it comes to search and advertising. Google still cuts corner on that. Like they are the dominant force in the market. I mean, OpenAI can introduce their, you know, they can go against DuckDuckGo. Best of luck to you going up against Bing. But like, this is not, you know, like you're not, you're not quite chasing the the big elephant yet. I think that where a lot of this comes from is the fact that all of the alternatives that Google had tried to really put into the market and really tried to make stick did not satisfy regulators. It didn't satisfy consumers and it sure as heck didn't satisfy advertisers. And if you couldn't satisfy the two most important in that being, well, your advertisers and your regulators, screw the consumer, uh, you, you weren't going to go anywhere. Right. Right. And, and I think that's really where we landed. And, you know, yeah, I, I give Google a lot. I do actually give them a lot of credit for taking the hit and being transparent on it and trying and really coming back at the very end and being like, Hey, advertisers, we know we kind of, we, we, we thought we were going to get you a better alternative, but it was going to cost more and do less. Sorry. Brent says, yeah, and that's why Google didn't want to fight with one hand tied behind their back. Interesting theory, Brent. By the way, Brent, I sent you a back-end log, and if you want to hop in and say hi before we wrap, uh, we're going to wrap in a few. I know you usually have a show pending, though, so you may have, you, usually Maybe. you have e- fisticuff, no. fisticuffs with John. So... Uh, but if you, Clive, but if you don't want to talk pop about on, Kate it, Pop being on, no, Clive. I'm stopping you right oh, there. You're going to get him right with Clive there. here. Oh, here we go. Clive, don't, don't start giving me, don't start encouraging K pop with, with Gen AI. I need my black face <laughs> to be authentic. I need, I really, mm, no, no, no. I'm going to set my seven year old on you, Clive. You're, you're drawing the line there, huh? Yeah. My line is clearly K pop. It might be T Swift too, but right now it's K pop. Yeah, well, although the picture of the pigeons that looked like they were on a new like NWA album cover, I can't decide whether it was an actual picture of pigeons or like an AI created image of picture pigeons. And so, Brent Leary, what what's up? what's up, Atlanta, Brent? The varmints again, Liz. Really? They don't have varmints in Seattle. Come on, but they have them in AI, Brent, and that's what's important. Yeah, the AI varmints. Anyway, no, this is a great conversation. And Liz, you know, the victory lap, very nice. I, Absolutely. It's when I say crazy things and everyone looks at me crazy. That's when I figure <laughs> someday I'm taking a lap on this. Like someday, <laughs> a lap on this one. So, so Brent, you, you've been tracking CX for a long time, before it was called CX, before you pe- even knew what that meant. Yeah, man. So, you just want to call me old and just, you know. Hey, man. <laughs> we're we're all we're all we're all a little grizzled here. So so so, what is your reaction to all this? What the Google? Yeah thing? yeah yeah yeah. Hey, it's like I said. You know, I think the the original move was because Apple. You know, well, you go back to I think it was the May twenty fourth, twenty twenty Apple update that changed all the policies and made it 
that you had to uh, opt in to get uh, all this, you know, personalized experience stuff as opposed to opt out. Uh, that that put a spotlight on privacy for the really for the first time. And, you know, and yeah. I don't know for how long. And I think, you know, Facebook member of Facebook made their little announcement. And after we got done laughing at it, uh, then Google came out with all this stuff. And I think, you know, they kept on backtracking like Liz was saying is like, oh, we're going to do it now. Oh, no, it's going to be a little later. And then they got to a point where, you know, they actually might have some competition with with open AI. I mean, this is just me speculating. It's probably the announcement was probably well ahead of that. But it just feels like, you know, you yeah. got Microsoft working with open AI and open AI has been, you know, gangbusters with chat GPT. And then they announced this search GPT thing. I'm like, Google's probably like, look, we can't afford to, you know, be Mr. Nice Guy and, and work with one hand tied bef- behind our back anymore. So it's pure speculation on my part. Interesting. It's interesting. the bulk of their business. I it's mean, like, advertising, yeah. I, like, I get that we all love to like luxuriate around like Google Cloud conversations. And I'm not <laughs> saying that we all shouldn't, but everyone's like, oh my God, Google Cloud's going to be so powerful. <laughs> it's, but like the it's a bit attack and like eleven yeah. percent of their business, like the yeah. rest of it, it is never threatens them. Advertising, yeah. like they are never going to let anything come and even get close to taking a percentage point. Oh, yeah, like Duck Duck Go or Brave, they're they're like right. nibbling, like little yeah, nibbles. I think yeah. altogether they're two percent of the market, yeah. and, you know. And but you know what? They're perfect for the people they're perfect for. Yeah, and, oh, and they should exist, right? Like they're great privacy awareness search engines, and they're fantastic if you want to have all that and on, you know, like if they're great. But as you said, it's not going to threaten the the mothership. No. But Chat no. GPT and Microsoft combination with with what's going on with this search, G- I think you know, like I said, I'm just purely speculated. It yeah. makes sense that maybe now they feel a little bit of heat, uh, the potential, the future of heat. And they're like, look, we don't need to be fighting know, one, you know, one arm tied behind our backs anymore. The the one I'm waiting for, the the smackdown, like the little swat away that I'm waiting for, is Microsoft. Because if you're Microsoft and you've been fighting all this time, right? You have been fighting, leaning in, bing, we're not giving up on it. <laughs> we're still moving forward. Like we're gonna hold on to this. This is gonna be our church engine. Like, oh! You know, and and Bing does like every once in a while you see a little jump and Bing and it it steals a little <laughs> bit away from Google and we all get really excited in the search world like ah oh my God Bing did it they got another point five percent like if I'm Microsoft I'm looking over at those kids at OpenAI being like I'm sorry what'd you say mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like did you no because you're because because you're not going after Google's lunch. Yeah, you're not, yeah, you're, you're taking, taking a little Google's piece lunch. of the Bing pie there. <clears throat> yeah. You're little, taking a little too much. <laughs> the Bing pie. Right? You, you think no you think maybe Satya got on the phone there, made a little hey, hey, little hey, tough hey. love there. <laughs> but you know, it was probably more a selfie, like, like, hey, uh, <laughs> uh, hello, Sam. You almost you almost lost your frigging company, except for me. You know, I got all the people that cared about ethics out of your company. <laughs> you right. owe me a favor. Ethics, you know. What are those? Yeah. <laughs> Can you chat GPT? Uh, I don't what know, man. Are ethics and but do I know, need them? A couple of months ago, or maybe it was a little longer on that. Remember, perplexity all of a sudden started looking at how they can integrate ads into what they're doing. I mean, we can't get away from ad- look. We can't get away can't from, get from, away from it. money. It's the golden goose. Our like attention it, is yeah. People like, people would rather pay with their attention than with their money, and so oh, unless sure. that changes. I don't see a lot of things changing. Yeah. It's like, and the funny thing is, is like, you know, you had said it earlier, like privacy doesn't rank really high on that list of things we really have to fight for. But you know what does rank high? Don't be creepy. Like (laughs) that consumers will rather say, I'm not going to give you my data. I'm not going to watch that thing. Mm. Even as much as I want that 10 minutes of free internet at the airport, (laughs) I'm not going to watch that video because you're being creepy. Right. Like, ew, you gross me out. Yeah, if you cross that you're line. Gonna, yeah, if, if you you're cross not going to be creepy, yeah. yeah, I'm at the airport. Yeah, like, who cares about a firewall? But anyway, like, I, you're, <laughs> you're going to log on to that free internet. I, I have to find out if I'm a Carrie or if I'm a Samantha, right? Like, I need right. to understand that in my sex in the city quiz. So I'm not going to read the fine print. I don't care what you do with all my data. Yes, see, all of my Facebook friends 
here they are. I've served up. I'm glad you explained that because I had no idea who you, who Carrier or the other person was you were talking about. So. Sex and Sorry. Come on. Uh, Come on. There are all these quizzes. You know, like when you go and take the quiz, like, <laughs> who are, you know, which Avenger are you? Like, I have to find out about uh, Thor that you will go and take that quiz. Yeah. And on that, dying to know. And on that note, uh, thanks, Liz, for clearing the, the way for me to, to move for, move on from the Sex in the City talk. And uh, I, I got to go and fight the, yeah, the, you got, the bold one here. So. You got to go fi- fight it out. Yeah. Have fun, Brent. Thanks for chiming in. Catch ah, you this later. This is a lot of fun. Yeah. Catch you later, man. Minus the, the uh, varmints. But anyway. Varmints. Yeah, see you. Raccoons. Bye. So, all right. Well, that was cool. So, nice to have a cameo from Brent. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah, well, and grabbing me on, man. Yeah, so basically, we can look forward to being stalked all over the w- all over the web by creepy yeah. brands and. Awesome. Yeah, I think we're gonna see all those creepy list vendors, like you know, like all the bad actors are gonna come jumping yeah. back to life. We're gonna see a lot of gold coins for sale. Yeah, you know, like I hope anyone who's ever lost hair in their life is ever going to enjoy seeing all of the hair loss. You know, think it's well. Just imagine all the advertising that's on X right now. It's gonna go back to being everywhere. Not just there. So I think there's one one quick thing when we wrap here, which is I think yeah. that the interesting thing is that while I think you do make a really good point around X that just because you have a lot of data on someone doesn't mean you're going to deliver a better experience to them. I think that's 100% true. But I do think that there are going to be some brands that do a really good job of yes. take, taking your opt-in data and doing some useful stuff with it, right? And, Absolutely. and that's where Absolutely. the, that's where the opportunity in all this BS lies, right? Is to take it, um, 100%. to, to do all kinds of cool stuff with it, not necessarily train your AI with it, though. That's certainly a possibility and that can happen, but it's more about how that fits into the overall framework of how you, how you, how you 100%. identify with customers and how you serve your customers. Right. So that's the it's, opportunity. Do you yeah. respect them or are you there to exploit them? Right. right. And the companies that are going to lean into, I respect them and God, I want them to experience all this cool stuff that I see about my brand and I'm going to co-create with them. Like this whole age we're walking into with AI is the opportunity for us to actually collaborate and co-create with our customers in real time in ways we have never been able to before. Brands from around the world can literally have any conversation they want to with any customer because of translation, because of all this information. Like, it is cool as all get out, right? We, ca- we can do that. And the more we do that with rich data where we can really have these relevant conversations, it's going to be awesome. But we're also going to have to all agree that when that annoying company that's just trying to slice through and make us buy more and do creepy things and do bad things, that the punishment is we don't do business with you. Like, we walk with our wallet, see you later, peace out, bye. That's the only way you learn a lesson. Indeed. Well, let's end on that note of semi-techno optimism because we don't get that on my show that often. We don't. But, but we, we don't. need we need we need the possibilities as well as the dystopia. So thank you for bringing both, and uh, and thanks. And if you can hang out backstage for just a sec, I have one thing yeah, to ask yeah. you. And thanks all for joining. And catch you next time. Bye bye. <laughs>